Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Stan Tatkin. If you don't know Stan, he is an author, a rather prolific author (laughs) and couples therapist. He's also the founder or co-creator of the PACT Institute. And today we're going to be talking all about conflict in relationships and how we can experience conflict in a safe way and really build secure foundations in our relationships so that we can grow together through conflict. Stan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Stephanie. It's really nice meeting you. Yeah, likewise. So your book that has just been released is called In Each Other's Care, a guide to the most common relationship conflicts and how to work through them. I must say, I love the title of In Each Other's Care. There's something very beautiful and tender about that. Thank you. I, it, actually, that is a, um, a phrase that was there from the very beginning uh, when yeah. I developed PACT. Um, mm. It was based on a, a psychobiological uh, mm. notion that human beings, human primates, are built to co-regulate uh, mm-hmm. or mutually regulate in mm-hmm. close proximity, particularly face-to-face, eye-to-eye. And mm-hmm. so couple therapy had been uh, focused on, I think, self-regulation more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way it works, starting with infants and caregivers, is it's this is the motion. Nobody can see this, but I'm crossing <laughs> my, my hands over instead of being in your own care, in the primary attachment relationship, you're actually in each other's care. And that's actually more efficient and a better way to think uh, and operate than being in one's own care only, which is a one person psychological system. Yeah. It's ironic though, isn't it? That a lot of the time we feel so, or we launch so quickly into self-protective patterns and maybe we forget about the part of our responsibility to be in each other's care and that co-regulation, that reciprocity of care, because I think we can become very self-centered or self-absorbed when we launch into that self-protective pattern, uh, when we are feeling threatened in our relationship. So it feels like there's this tussle at play um, and that you know, in intimate relationships, sometimes that person who is closest to us can raise the alarm more than anyone else in our systems. Well, uh, the reason for that is because we recognize each other, especially if it's a family member, right? We recognize Mm -hmm. each other and we have a memory and a history of Mm -hmm. threat cues, of facial expressions and vocal tone and movements and postures and gestures, but also words and phrases um, that trigger, uh, you know, a threat memory. So Mm. that's family. But when you fall in love and you find somebody that you want to be with, there's uh, a a, a general um, belief in pair bonding with humans that we only pair bond with people with whom we recognize and find Mm. familiar enough, which means that we're going to be proxies for everything and everybody Mm. that we've experienced going all the way back to childhood. So Mm. that's why um, it's so difficult because Mm. we're memory animals and we're also have a survival instinct and you would think that we would know the difference between friend and foe and be able to hold on to an idea that this is our child, this is our partner, this is the person I love, but we're easily threatened. And when we are, our brain changes and we, uh, we revert to self-protection. And that's unfortunately, fortunately, the human condition, it knows no gender no sex, no Mm -hmm. culture, no, uh, right. Uh, it is all of us. And that's Mm -hmm. one of the, uh, struggles, um, that we have to recognize and learn how to override our, Mm -hmm. our primitive nature. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been a huge part of my own personal journey and the work that I do with other people is cultivating a level of 
mastery or at the very least conscious awareness over those triggers and going, okay, if I'm launching into physiologically in a very felt sense kind of way, rather than just following the feeling and acting on it, can I get curious about what it is about this situation or this moment, this dynamic that feels unsafe to me? Um, Can I dig a little deeper and uh, approach myself with a level of curiosity rather than just launching into an attack on my partner or defensiveness or any of the other things that we can so easily fall into? Well, even even your mentioning of the word curiosity um, puts you know, sets you apart from most. Uh, mm. Most people are not curious. Most people are not curious in relationship. They're not curious mm. about themselves, their history. They're not curious about how their mind works, and they're not curious of how their partner's mind works. That mm. is um, unfortunately a very small. Uh, uh, part of the world population. Most of us are just going about our day, um, doing what we think um, is uh, right based on our upbringing, based on our family culture, based on what we know and what we experienced in our lives. And that's about it. The only people that do question, I think, are people that are enriched in their environment. But even those people um, I, I believe um, there has to be some suffering in one's life to motivate uh, one to be interested in oneself mm-hmm. and another. Um, yeah. So, so that, you yeah. know, it's great that you think about curiosity. I wish most more people did. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think there's a, a level of suffering or struggle and we get to a point where we can't just um, claim victimhood anymore without looking um, certainly if we want to make meaningful change we have to take responsibility and go okay what's actually going on here because if I'm just living out the same pattern the same you know variations on a theme in consecutive relationships or even within the same relationship there's something there to look at and I think that you know, with any of these things, it's an invitation into curiosity and to go, okay, can I approach uh, myself with that lens of, you know, what right. is going on here? Regret, you know, lots of studies on regret being essential mm. for learning. And uh, mm. Peter Fonny, uh, uh, the uh, wonderful uh, psychoanalyst and thinker in Britain, uh, and somebody who uh, studies infants as well, um, did a study on people who don't regret. Uh, And uh, these are, you know, uh, basically people who are doing gambling uh, and whether they learn from their mistakes. Uh, Mm. And he found and others found that people who don't regret don't change. They don't learn. Mm. Um, And so loss and regret, (laughs) remorse, grieving, is uh, an essential part of growing up and becoming a better, wiser, smarter Mm -hmm. person. Yeah, and I think there's such an important distinction between regret, which can guide us to course correct, and shame, which tends to sink us into numbing or low self-worth and can keep us stuck. But I agree, I think regret can be a very powerful teacher if we're willing to learn the lessons. In here, regret, I'm thinking less about shame because that doesn't, mm. that's not a change agent either. Mm. But, you know, more aligned with guilt, more yeah. aligned with loss, um, mm-hmm. a, a higher uh, level of development than simply yeah. uh, being ashamed. Right? Yeah. So maybe we could take a step back and talk a little more about this concept of secure functioning that you set out in the book. Um, Relatedly, I remember from Wired for Love, one of your earlier books, this concept of the couple bubble. Um, I would love for you to give us a bit of an overview of those concepts and maybe set the scene on on what we can hope for and what we should be working to build in our relationships and the importance of that secure unit at the heart of a relationship. So a lot of a lot of my thinking uh, comes from research and science, um, mm. but uh, I've always 
been a clinician at heart, um, even though I love teaching, um, clinician at heart, and the challenge has always been how to how to make the science uh, understandable to a, a lay audience, but also mm-hmm. how to communicate that in in my work with um, with my clients, right? And so that's been a constant. At the bottom of this has to do with uh, the you know uh, what we understand about our species and what we understand about infant attachment and attachment throughout the lifespan. And then also how the brain develops, particularly the social emotional brain throughout the lifespan and the, the differences between us all in terms of our abilities, you know, uh, uh, our diversity in terms of being able to operate under different conditions, especially stress. So, The couple bubble comes from the idea that we are a species that is that forms dyads in herds, and so mm. we're particularly dyadic. I know they're not, you know, they're outliers, people that are not, but we tend to mm. form dyads, and those dyads replicate the earliest dyad or you know the earliest experiences of dependency with our caregivers, and so. Mm-hmm. It operates by certain rules, whether we like it or not. It just, there's a biology behind primacy. That mm. if you and I are uh, are in a romantic relationship and we've already feel like we've committed, there's, um, there's an, an, a tendency to expect and to have a certain amount of entitlement to being primary, not secondary or tertiary or being demoted, we're, um, we're central and, and other people tend to orbit around us um, unless, uh, unless we agree otherwise, right? So a couple bubble basically is, uh, is a unit of two operating as a two-person psychological system of interdependence. In other words, you and I as adults have the same thing to gain, same things to gain, same things to lose. And we're supposed to be in a free society, um, uh, a union of, uh, of shared power and authority. Therefore, we protect each other from the environment. This is true throughout the mammalian world. You know, pair bonding isn't just for, uh, for procreation or you know, taking care of the young. But it's also a survival mechanism. Uh, we're better in numbers. And so in a dyadic situation, you and I have to, we don't have to, but if we want the relationship to last, we have to operate by certain, uh, certain ideas that uh, if we don't protect each other in, in public and private, we will view each other as unfriendly. We'll view each other as adversaries. And mm-hmm. so... Uh, so we protect each other from each other and everyone else uh, by uh, by working together and being sensitive to each other. So the couple bubble basically is our protection from mm. from the world um, that is, as it's always been, frivolous, unpredictable, um, indifferent, uh, opportunistic, and scary, uh, mm. as it's always been. Yeah. So I wonder if, you know, if the couple bubble is this idea of the relationship comes first and there's this primacy to the relationship unit and we both have this duty to protect that and to protect one another and to prioritize that. Um, I wonder if there are any other examples of maybe principles that come out of the concept of a couple bubble in a more you know practical or tangible way if people are interested in what that might look like in a relationship you know how do you establish and protect a couple bubble so people should understand that secure functioning isn't the same as as secure attachment mm-hmm. um, secure functioning is uh you know, is based on social contract theory. It's it's a series of social contracts between you and I. So we don't have a duty of any kind unless we decide that is the case. So you and I come together to create something called a relationship, which 
actually doesn't really exist in life. It is, uh, it is an abstraction. It's something we co-create. And uh, otherwise, you, you, know, we, you can't take a picture of a relationship. You can just take a picture of people. So the relationship that you and I have has to have a certain a consciousness to it. A, 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 um, it can't be just based on love and attraction, right? Mm. It has to be or should be based on purpose. Like, Why do we exist? What are we going to do and what are we never going to do? Just like any union that forms because of common interests, common needs, either we need to survive or we need to win or we want to make money, or why are we doing this? Uh, and so the same with the couple, that if we, if we don't, you and I, co-create, like, a, like a molding a block of clay, you know, we're, we're shaping something that is uniquely ours throughout our time together, and that it's based on fairness and justice and mutual sensitivity, that... Mm-hmm. We have to work together as allies, or we cannot work. We can, you know, if you imagine uh, being in a um, potato sack race. I don't know if they have potato sack races <laughs> in, in Australia, um, but you, but if you have that image, you know that uh, if we, you and I, were to do that, we would have to work together, or we will look ridiculous. You know, uh, uh, if I move ahead of you, we'll both fall. If, I, you know, if, if we pull in different directions, we don't go anywhere. That's the same thing. That's this. You and I have to um, find where we are the same and where we agree so we can move together and create the things we want and to solve the problems that we face without trying to solve each other, which is war. Right? I love that last line, solving the problems without solving each other. Oh. I, I put out a video last week and it said essentially yeah. we, one of the most, uh, one of the most loving things you can do is accept your partner. You know, it's really something that we maybe don't realize how consistently we reject or disapprove of, or try to change our partner to mm-hmm. meet our own ends. Um, and I was met with this barrage of comments from people saying, well, if I accept them the way they are, then I won't get my needs met. And, you know, there was this very self-protective thing. And right. so I would love for you to speak more to that. You know, how can both of those things exist? How can I accept and love you? And how can we negotiate so there's space for both of us to thrive here? To, um, to accept each other as is, is to be in reality right? Um, is to be in reality. Uh, I accept you as you are, perfectly imperfect as am I, annoying, a pain in the ass as am I, disappointing, contradictory as am I, um, a burden as am I. So what? What's next? How are we going to work together as those things? Because there has to be something greater than our comparing and contrasting mind, which is always at work, you know, for good reason, um, if we're trying to pick fruit (laughs) and, you know, ripe fruit, comparing and contrasting, very good, this car, that car, very good. Um, But other times it is uh, how we get disappointed, feel um, let down, feel like, uh, you know, I'd rather be with this person than that person. Um, We have features in our in our mind that are uh, f- that are really important for survival, but not great for happiness. Like always being aware of what we don't have, right? So, uh, so the mature person understands this and accepts that good enough is perfect. There is no perfect. Yeah. Good enough is perfect, and you are working together. So. I accept you as you are. I don't need you to change. You don't need me to change, but that's different than how you and I will do business. Mm. There's a difference between who we are and how we do business. That's been true throughout civilization, throughout time. That is it. You don't need Mm. to change. How we work together is constantly being formed so we actually work 
collaboratively and cooperatively and and right and peaceably. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we'll damage each other yeah. just by being human. Ironically, the more that we can accept one another, the more likely we're going to have a level of buy-in and willingness and openness to do the compromising. Mm -hmm. So I think that while we might hold back from accepting because we worry that to accept someone means making all of these sacrifices and losing out, uh, in reality, it's the accepting one another that actually provides the entry point into connection and doing the work and compromising in a way that just doesn't feel as inherently oppositional and threatening. Well, think, think what it's like in childhood. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Imagine that your parents don't accept you as you are. They wish you would be more like your sibling or mm -hmm. can't you be like this person down the block? Um, get that enough. And this is when we want to run away from home mm -hmm. um, that who we are is not embraced. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, it's never enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's an injury that carries over. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if we experience that, re remember the adult primary attachment relationship is is almost one to one what the infant mm -hmm. mother attachment relationship is. Mm -hmm. It follows the same rules. It crashes and burns in the same way. Mm -hmm. It succeeds in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, so the very same thing, I can't grow, I can't um, become um, unless I'm with someone who looks at me uh, with eyes that, uh, that thinks I'm good, mm -hmm. right? I'm good and uh, right? uh, otherwise uh, I won't have any resources to develop, I won't have any resources to be better, I can't really perform mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. because uh this relation relational orbit is is what provides the resources to do life mm. yeah and i think just practically speaking any change or influence over a partner that comes from a place of disapproval and shaming them and criticizing it's not it's not authentic it's not real it's not you know, you might be getting what you want in a very superficial way, but it's really not what you need. And so I think that providing that fertile soil for growth from a place of genuine love, care and acceptance and respect for the other is so much more sustainable in the long term. So back to secure functioning, I accept you as you are, mm. but we have agreements that protect us. Mm. And and uh, and uh, uh, focus us to what we want to be, how we want to be, right, and how we're going to protect uh, us from each other. Therefore, I can accept you. I accept you fully, but I can also stop you from doing something we agreed that we wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. If it's a if it's a principle like. We, you know, my wife and I have this, we can go to bed angry, but we have to at least touch toes. <laughs> now, there's, there's, a, there's a science behind that, by the way. Mm. Um, it's very folksy. The science behind that has to do with um, uh, us uh, as human primates suffering an existential crisis, a, a, a really a survival issue, if we are angry with each other and we don't repair it, or we don't somehow say to each other, signal, I'm angry with you, Stephanie, but we're okay. Mm. You know, you know, you could say, I hate you, Stan, but we're okay. Mm. The we're okay part is the minimal, but ab absolutely sufficient thing that we have to um, experience. Otherwise, we suffer greatly mm. and we get sick. Mm. It's not... Uh, it's not a matter of politeness. We actually truly get sick mm. uh, because we're in an existential crisis uh, akin to when we were uh, infants. Mm. And so people don't understand that. Um, uh, and so touching toes, whether touching toes or touching mm. at all, 
it tends to be an unequivocal signal of friendliness. Mm -hmm. And then we can sleep. And usually we don't even have to revisit anything because that's enough Mm -hmm. to just drop the hostility. Yeah. And I think for so many of us who haven't, for whatever reason, whether it's childhood or previous relationships, a lot of people haven't learned that I can be angry with you and still love you. And that is Mm -hmm. really makes conflict feel so high stakes and so deeply threatening, which again, exacerbates all of the self-protective mechanisms, both, you know, at a neurobiological level and at an intellectual level. But when I don't think that we can have conflict and still be okay, then of course it feels very dangerous and we're going to act accordingly. A lot of this is development. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is, you know, if I could, I would. Mm -hmm this idea of when I am upset with you to be able to keep things in mind Mm. that I love you. I'm mad at you. Mm. I want to punch you, but I adore, I adore you. Um, uh, Holding those two things in mind is, is a developmental achievement for many Mm. and, uh, and, and is very hard to hold Um, to be able to remain a two-person psychological system under stress is really hard um, because they're, they're, uh, if my heart rate goes up a certain level or yours and our blood pressure goes up a certain level, um, uh, it's very hard to maintain um, uh, uh, an ability to think, first of all. Um, but also we are more likely to uh, protect our own interests Uh, the more aroused we get. Mm. Unless we're skilled and unless we have a greater sense of purpose, unless we understand Mm. and have practiced, right, how to, how to, um, to keep us from going off the cliff every time, Mm. right? One of us has to do something uh, that's, that is extremely friendly to the other person to snap them out of it. Otherwise, we both keep going off the cliff. Mm. This is the human condition is what I was talking about. Mm. Um, Everybody will do this Mm. unless they understand how this works. Mm. Well, I think that'd be a really nice segue into sharing some practical tools for, you know, threat reduction or ways that we can bring the temperature down when we feel that, you know, those cues are starting to arise, whether it's in anticipation of a hard conversation or there's some sort of stress in the relationship, what are some things that people can do that are really effective? Because I, I find this is so useful because it, it is tangible and it's easy a lot of the yeah. time once you know how to do it. Um, it's simple. Yeah, it's simple. just hard to yeah, do. Yeah, that's probably better. Simple but not easy. <laughs> uh, when you go live yeah. with people who are, and people are really difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, especially when we go live, mm. right? That's, that's a, a real experience that moves at lightning speeds and is being processed subcortically by recognition systems. We mostly are using pattern recognition mm. most of our time during the day. That makes everything easier, but it also leads to bias. It leads to prejudice. It leads to mm. shooting first and asking questions later, mm. right? Um, I'm recognizing something, and if I feel threatened, I'm going to act. Right? I don't think. Mm. So it's, it's both a, a nice thing and it's a problem. Mm. Um, th- th- this book, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I just realized recently why I start to over-focus on certain things. Everything I've learned, I, I obsess over until I know it inside and out. And, um, and, and I can be, I can feel confident in the reliability of the idea, right? And so with this book, I realize, looking back, that my obsession was on structure and the manner in which we interact when one or both of us is under stress. Those are two areas that will, uh, that will tank any relationship, um, either sooner or later. Having no structure, we didn't co-create anything. Mm. We don't have a shared vision of where we're going and why. We don't have a shared purpose other than love, right? 
we have each other's backs. You know, we're a survival team. We, we're radical protectors of each other. Um, we're time travelers. Um, we're, we're um, you know, we're going to do great things in the world together, right? Yeah. Uh, but whatever it is, whatever it is, but, but no idea of ourselves that looks down the road and no structure as if, as if we don't need it. Uh, it's astonishing to me that people will continue to just say, oh, we'll do it. You know, you would never do that. I would never do that. It's nonsense. It's naive. Human beings can do terrible, terrible things without being terrible people. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, <laughs> this is us uh, as human beings. We're wonderful and we can be really awful. Um, and so without having guidelines, without you and I creating a civilization, a society of, of our ethics, our, you know, what is our ethical relationship going to be? What is, you know, what are our personal morals and how are we going to rein each other in? How are we going to govern each other mm. is so vital that I can't say enough about it. Uh, mm. Most of the problems in relationship is that there is nothing. Mm. They're flying a plane that's half built, uh, a house that's hardly constructed, and it looks weird. Um, it's clearly, uh, you know, slapdash. Mm. So number one is getting together and starting to think, where do we want to go from here? Why are we doing it? What's in it for us? Mm. Um, and what could possibly go wrong? Based on what has gone wrong mm. and to start to actually be hands-on mm. with this career that is relationship, mm. right? That's one. And the other is, uh, again, uh, the manner in which you and I will interact when one or both of us is under stress. Mm. There's a brain change. Therefore, we have to, again, think ahead. We can't wait to go live every time and rinse and repeat. We have to think ahead. Mm. What will I do next time? I just blew it with Stephanie. Mm. Now, my tendency, as everyone's tendency, is to blame Stephanie. Mm. What should Stephanie do next time? Stephanie is, uh, there's a problem with Stephanie, mm. right? That's what we all do. Mm. But that will not work. The only thing that works is I have to think that I'm responsible for Stephanie's reactions. Mm. I'm her handler. I am the one um, who's supposed to be masterful at Stephanie. Mm. I'm supposed to know how to handle Stephanie at any time, with, in any state she gets into without using a stick or a whip. Mm. That's because that's where my focus goes. And that's one thing that people can start to orient towards. Mm. Uh, think about your approach, what you're doing, what your face could be doing, what your voice could be doing, the word choices that you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, if your partner is upset, you did something. Yeah. <laughs> Accept it. Yeah. You did something, right? Um, uh, you don't get angry at your horse because you approach it in the wrong way and it, and it gets skittish. You don't beat the horse for reacting because you scared it. If you keep approaching your horse that way, who's the idiot? Mm. Okay. So and not that you're a horse, Stephanie, <laughs> but we're but we're animals. Yeah. We're animals. And you are the animal I picked. Mm -hmm. My job is to be competent, but we don't think about that. Mm. I want you to be competent with me. I don't think I should have to do anything. Yeah. And that is Again, part of the human condition. Human beings are, by nature, selfish, self-centered, uh, moody, fickle, opportunistic, xenophobic, and very warlike. Mm. Very warlike. Mm. Uh, if we don't realize that and put things in place, we're, we're really, uh, we get what we pay for, which is nothing or a lot of grief. So this is just, again, being in reality. Mm. So I have to learn you. I have to take responsibility for uh, for you, your reactions. I don't blame you for your perception. I don't argue that I didn't. My face didn't do that. 
first of all, I don't know what my face did. And secondly, who cares? Mm. If you felt it and you were hurt, I better take care of that or I'm going to pay for it. Mm. Yeah. Right? We're connected. We're intertwined. Our fates are, are, um, are um, you know, uh, are hooked in, yeah. right? There's no way I can separate that from you. Like the potato sack race, there's no way I can do that. Mm. Anything else is a misunderstanding of the situation. Mm. Therefore, it's a different orientation. It's a different way of thinking than we normally do. It's not I, me, my, and you, you, you. It's us and we. Yeah. We move yeah. together in lockstep or we don't move, mm. period. Yeah, it's a, it's a really radical reframing for a lot of people and the way we do relationships, right? To say like, I am actually responsible for tending to you and being attuned to you and responsive to yes. you. It's just counter to the way that a lot of people have learned how to be in relationship. Because we're entitled selfish idiots, <laughs> me included, me included. We get together and we think we're family. Mm. We forget we're not family. You and I are strangers. We will always be strangers. The formalities of being strangers have to be there. And we're constantly wanting to get to know each other throughout life. That goes against our nature. Our nature is to assume we're family, to automate each other, to never look at our faces again, <laughs> to, you know, uh, to remember your face. I haven't looked at it for a month. I have no idea what it looks like now. It, I have it in my head, right? But I don't look. Mm. Our, our, our tendencies... Um, in nature to conserve energy and to not pay attention is, uh, should be um, well known by now. Mm. Therefore, there's an active um, working against that mm. to, uh, to pay attention, to focus, to be present with our partner. Otherwise, uh, not only are we not enjoying them, but we're not really enjoying life. Mm. We're just uh, walking, uh, you know, with uh, using automation and memory, uh, which we do anyway. Mm. Um, but that's it. One thing that comes up for me in listening to the way that you describe that responsibility to be responsible for our partner, as we would, you know, an animal handler. Um, I, I've heard another teacher refer to, you know, the that film, The Horse Whisperer, you know, bringing horse yeah. whisperer energy yeah. to our partner, um, I think yeah. is is very apt. What I can imagine some I've people... Got to be a, I've got to be a Stephanie Whisperer yeah. is what I have to be. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And, you know, again... So often we're doing the exact opposite of that, right? If someone starts to show signs of being threatened or feeling unsafe, we escalate in response, which is, you know, the opposite of what we would do with a, a traumatized, afraid animal. And yet we, that's how we respond to each other. Um, it's runs yeah. counter. And some people would be aggressive with a, a, a scared child mm. or a scared partner or a scared animal. Mm. Some people will mm. do that. Yeah. Because helplessness is the thing that makes us most aggressive. Mm. The thing that I, I wonder and I can imagine people asking themselves is how do we make sure we don't go too far in that? Because I know that a lot of people in my audience lean more towards anxious attachment and there can be a pattern of maybe taking too much responsibility to the point of tiptoeing or um, over-indexing on that trying to manage someone else's emotional state, how do we make sure that that finds a balance point that is interdependent and mutual rather than one person being the sole caretaker of the other? So I know, I know what you mean when you say anxious attachment, mm. you're referring to Ainsworth's or mm. Mary Ainsworth, anxious ambivalent, mm. but, uh, but your audience should keep in mind that both sides of the insecure spectrum are, are by definition anxious, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Voidant is anxious, anxious about being trapped, being having their their autonomy, their stuff being taken from them. Mm -hmm. They're really very anxious. Actually, the most anxious, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we want to look at, at the physiology of yeah. avoidance, they're most anxious. They're just unaware of yeah. it. Um, but uh, so um, what was what was it you said? I, I got lost. No, that's okay. I was saying, you know, I, I know a lot of people have already a tendency to over-index on that and to kind of 
arguably take more responsibility than they should to the point where they self-abandon or, or lose themselves. How do we find that middle this point? Is, relationships, the adult relationship is pay to play. Mm. It's based on, should be based on terms and conditions, deal or no deal. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to do this. You're going to do it too. Mm. If you don't do what I'm doing, because we're in this together, this is a team, pal, right? I don't carry your water unless you're carrying mine too. Yeah. Um, we're going to have a sit down. This is not codependency. Mm. I am not doing this in hopes you'll do something for me. I expect it mm. and you should expect it from me because we're two or the only two pillars of this union. Mm. Our survival depends on us pulling our own weight and in doing what we must to make this relationship worth every penny, every blood, sweat, and tear. Otherwise, I'm out. Mm. Now, that's why I say deal or no deal. Mm. Here's the problem. With that. <laughs> Sounds so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> uh. Here's the real problem with that is the attachment biology. Mm. The attachment biology we confuse with love. Mm. It isn't love. It's a biological mandate mm. um, of I can't quit you. Mm. We don't even understand it, but we feel it primitively, intensely. It's like we're going to die if I lose you. I can't lose you. I could say it's you know, the kids or the car or the money, the house, whatever. But it's really also at the bottom of this, a biology that nature has built in, a glue that holds us together for various reasons, None of them having to do with relationship, by the way. Mm. Nature doesn't care about relationship. We do. Mm. Right? We have to understand that. So the, the attachment biology is groovy. It, it is what makes us stick together. It's, what ki it's what's kept us from, uh, from uh, murdering each other completely. Mm. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but it also can, can confuse us with love and keep us in a relationship where it is unfair, mm. where it is not in two directions, where it is codependent, mm. which both people are responsible for, by the way. Mm. So you and I make sure um, we're in a foxhole together. This is serious business. Mm. Uh, there is no pass. You don't get a pass for your drug and alcohol use. I don't get a pass for my trauma history. I've got to show up or or there's no reason for us to do this. Mm. I know that sounds no, I... cold hearted. It's a survival unit, yeah. folks. Yeah. And I think that it really invites people into the vulnerability of being direct about this stuff, because we can hide in, as you say, like so many of us don't have a map or an agreement or kind of a, um, yeah. Bill of Rights, for want of a better term, on like what are the parameters of our relationship? What do we stand for? What do we care about? What are our joint values? If only people would just think about it yeah. instead of just assume it all works out, yeah. which it doesn't. Yeah, it's so often we aren't on the same page and we assume we are, and that causes us a great deal of strife. And we feel very hurt and we make it mean something about, yes. you know, the other person, how they feel about us when really we just weren't brave enough or uh, wise enough to actually have the conversation. Think dance troupe, think rock and roll band, think, um, mm. think cop car partners, think, or, you know, a military unit you're in the foxhole with. Mm. Um, um, th all of these are interdependent relationships based on a common interest and need mm. to survive, to win, to, uh, to, be famous, whatever it is, mm. but that's why we're together. Mm. That's not why, you know, we're not together because we love each other. <laughs> we're together because we have a shared mission. Mm. Only couples mm. don't do it. Yeah. And it is one of the reasons why couple relationships on the whole won't last very long or they will, but they won't be happy mm. because people won't think of this as a true union mm. of, of equals and very, very different people. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose that's really what makes it a partnership, right? I think the word partnership has that quality to it. It's like we're in this together, we're a team. And yet for yeah. so many of us, particularly in times of stress or, or any of the other things that life throws at us, 
we turn into enemies or competitors when things get hard rather than banding together and being stronger for it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that has to be solid. You and I have to uh, raise the bar and believe in something greater than ourselves. Yeah. And uh, you know, some people it's God, other people it's, uh, it's principles, character, mm. um, values. Um, what, we, what you and I believe is truly good mm. together and what we believe is truly right. Mm. Now the question is, will we do what's good and what's right when it's the hardest thing to do. Mm. And that's, that's um, where I'm trying to point people. Yeah. Including myself. Right? Yeah. And I think that um, that is in, in those times of stress, inevitable times of stress, when our, everything in our being and our body will be telling us to go the selfish route. <laughs> it's then yeah. more than ever that we need to resist that impulse and turn the other way and turn towards our partner rather than, you know, becoming very tunnel visioned yeah. and, and self-focused. I do believe that once people start doing this, it's its own reward. Mm. It, it is, it is a practice. And I do believe that there is no other system, um, that will last, uh, um, the, a lifetime. There is no other system that can and be happy um, because other systems, anything else will end up being too unfair, um, and too unjust, too insensitive. And then there's a, uh, a buildup of resentment mm. and threat memory. Mm. And that is something people do not want mm. because it's the gift that keeps on giving, mm. right? You and I have done so badly in our interactions and we've acted in, in, in such a way that has been unkind without any repair. Mm. And now, um, now we see each other as adversaries, even when we walk into the room mm. with each other, because we built up so much of that memory that uh, we, there is no more trust. Mm. Right? And that's where people will go um, naturally mm. um, because of how they did business, how they put this thing together. Yeah, that's just such a body of evidence in support of all of those fear stories, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just humans being human. Yeah, it's actually quite rational by that point. It's like, well, I'm making I'm making an assessment based on everything I have known throughout our relationship. Um, that's that's people should understand that uh, our ability to remember where we're hurt because of survival mm. is very keen. Mm. So, if I hurt you, uh, um, I won't remember because I I didn't hurt me. I hurt you. Mm you'll remember. Mm. And if I didn't fix that in a timely manner, it'll go into long-term memory. And uh, I did that. Mm. I, this is a fact. I created that memory. Mm. That, um, I can't blame you for remembering this. I created it because I didn't fix it quickly. If I fixed it quickly, you would never remember. Yeah. Stan, just before we wrap up, what would you say to people who have some sort of resistance to feeling like they need to learn this stuff because i think some people feel like love should carry a relationship like we shouldn't need to learn how to be together that this all sounds very formal and pragmatic and takes away from the romance of it what would you say to those people <laughs> i would say i i fully understand yeah. and party on <laughs> um um you know, I, I, I've been at this long enough. This has been my research. You know, I started studying babies and, and then started studying adults very, very carefully, very um, uh, systematically using um, digital video and frame analysis. So we've studied faces, studied bodies, studied how people act and react, mm -hmm. things that people don't ever even know because real time's too fast. So I, I've studied this. I can say, good luck to you. Um, hopefully it will, it will work out, but, um, this isn't rocket science. Mm. Um, study your history, look around, watch what's happening today. Um, this is, you know, people have not changed. Mm. Um, and so if you think that you can, uh, deal with another person through time, uh, without a structure, without building something together, without pointing in the same direction, um, Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Um, 
There are naturals. I've seen lots of natural couples, and they're really good mm. until they're not, mm. because life uh, throws curveballs. Mm. Uh, the vicissitudes of life, um, you know, are such that we can't predict what's coming, and but we can pretty much guess that what's coming isn't a lot of it's great and a lot of it's really bad. Mm. The question is, how good are we when it's really bad? Mm. Yeah. If we're naturals, yeah. we're going to fall apart. Mm. Because we need more than just being natural. Mm. We need training. We need to prepare for that. Yeah. We need the contingencies of, of all of those pre-agreed values and, and commitments to one another. And practice. It's, it's a practice. And it's hard to do. I'm, yeah. you know, it's, this is hard. Yeah. But worth you know, it. I'm, I'm, I'm stubborn and selfish and difficult as anybody. And, uh, but... But this, um, this changed my life, and I wouldn't be the person I am today or becoming the person if I didn't do this, and it is hard, mm. with lots of failure. Yeah. Yeah, but as you say, worth it, and I think you're right that it gets easier with time because we start to reap the rewards yeah. of it, and we start to trust in it more, yeah. and so that we create some momentum around that, and it does get marginally easier with each time round. <laughs> mm. One last thing, um, this is where the attachment system uh, is a hindrance. If I'm insecure and I've been insecure, I'm preloaded to not trust you. Yeah. Um, I'm preloaded to, uh, to know based on experience um, what will happen if I depend on you. Mm. And that'll cause me to protect myself in ways that will appear threatening to you, which is a problem. So. There is, you know, there is that to consider. Um, does any, can anybody, can, can one have the experience to know that fairness and justice in a union and the co-creation and working together exists, mm. right? Some people don't believe it does. Mm. I mean, they do intellectually, but when they get in it, how are you going to screw me? How am I going to lose on this? Mm. You know? Yeah. And, the, and so that's another challenge for people. Yeah, certainly. I think that's such a beautiful articulation of the essence of any expression of insecure attachment. I don't trust yeah. in my ability to depend on you. Bad things are going to happen. It's a me- it's because of memory. Yeah. yeah, and I think that really um, and and but you and I can change the memory yeah. by understanding it yeah. and not doing what is natural, which is to double down. Mm. And reinforce it, but to actually do what is unexpected, mm. and then that system, that that inflammation, that fear begins to settle down, and mm. uh, the memory is replaced by other memories. Mm. Of, yeah, this is possible. Yeah, such is the nature of this work, which is so very powerful. Yeah. And I am so grateful for all of your contributions and. In each other's care is now available, correct? It's out and in, in the world. Is. Great. So anyone yeah, listening, and, um, please do pick it and up. And I did the audio too. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah. So anyone who's listening, I have to say, I realize we we went a little off piste, but uh, the the structure of the book I think is really excellent because it sets out specific conflicts, you know, giving really tangible examples of places where people get stuck. So it's not Um, it's not purely theoretical. It's actually diving into the weeds of the kinds of conversations you might've had, uh, the types of fights that you might have experienced on repeat, or maybe you still experience on repeat. And it really walks you through what's going on there and, and what might be a path out of it. So definitely go and grab the book. I'm sure you'll learn a lot. Um, and Stan, thank you so much for joining me. It's been hugely valuable. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Stan. Thank you.